Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. Uh, my guest today is a returning guest, Paul Offit. Uh, he's director of the Vaccine Education Center and an attending physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, he has a very long history uh, in the fields of virology and immunology, many, many uh, accolades, many, many designations, uh, top person to speak to, and very glad to have him on this call. Uh, he's also going to be part of the virus book that I've been interviewing that you'll be hearing. Um, so I'm going to be asking him a lot of the same questions I've asked others. But uh, Paul, thanks for coming. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for asking me. Yeah, yeah no problem. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, tell me a little bit about your background. It's, I know it's incredibly extensive, but what, what got you interested in bioscience and then in particular viruses at some point? Um, well, the person who got me interested in viruses was Stanley Plotkin. I mean, when I came to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, to do a fellowship in infectious diseases, um, he had the year before basically invented the RA273 strain of rubella vaccine. And um, he was interested in, in also looking to see whether he could uh, do work on rotavirus toward the purpose for the purpose of making a rotavirus vaccine. So it was definitely Dr. Plotkin, who was just a, a leader in the field. And, the, you know, the book, the vaccines book is now called Plotkin's Vaccine. So he's 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 the guy. OK, excellent. And then your career in vaccines and immunology and viruses has, has spanned how many years approximately? Um, well, I mean, I I, uh, I guess I started working um, in 1980. So we're at uh, 40, 40 years. Oh, wow. I started being alive in the 70s. So amazing, because I'm so only 45. So I mean, how did that happen? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, just, for, you know, for a brief fast forward today at this moment, what are you, what's like some of your big projects? What are you working on? Um, well, I'm, I, uh, I'm right at the, today I'm working on, a, I was asked by the National Academy of Medicine to write a biography of Dr. Hilleman, Marie Hilleman, who I think in many ways is the father of modern vaccines. So I'm going to try and do that. I'm, I'm on the NIH active group, you know, that was put together by Francis Collins. And, um, you know, we're working on a piece for science translational medicine, just about prospects for a safe COVID-19 vaccine. I'm also on the FDA's vaccine advisory committee. So we're going to be meeting the end of October to discuss whether or not one or more vaccines will get uh, approval under emergency use authorization. So I've kept busy. Okay. Well, very good. Well, all right. So the, the questions, again, will be uh, probably difficult. And, uh, you know, I asked you to speculate freely. So. Um, so my first question that I'm asking people is, are there, are there any organisms or uh, forms of life that don't have viruses that you know of? And of the ones that do, any particularly interesting or unusual examples? Um, I Actually, I don't know of any any organisms that don't have viruses. I, I think the, the most interesting to me is is bacteriophages, you know, viruses that inf infect bacteria for, for a couple of reasons. One, because I remember when I was a, a high school student, I read the book Aerosmith by Sinclair Lewis. Uh, in what, this, this was a book written uh, in 1925. So it was really before the first antibiotic, which was sulfonilamide in the mid 1930s. So it's 10 years before the invention of antibiotics. And, um, you know, and, and in this fictional novel, he, which was, I think, uh, Paul de Kroof was a, um, was an advisor to the book. He he treats a, essentially a, a serious bacterial uh, outbreak in South America with bacteriophages. He injects people with viruses that kill bacteria. Does this fictional doctor, and you know stops that raging uh, epidemic in South America of the particular uh, bacterial infection. Uh, what's amazing to me about that is that you know fast forward you know almost a hundred years and that's what we're doing now because we've essentially taken our first steps into the post antibiotic era. We now are using bacteriophages, which is to say viruses that kill bacteria, and injecting them. There was a book called The Perfect Predator written by Stephanie Strathy along with her husband Tom Patterson. Uh, he's his life was saved by um, 
by being injected with, you know, billions of virus particles that were uh, specifically directed against bacteria. So, so I guess that's what's, that's part of it's interesting to me. And do you, um, in your experience, do you believe that viruses are alive or contingently alive once they enter a cell? What's your thoughts there? Why? I guess they're not capable of independent life. So, so they, can, they can only reproduce themselves. They can only live to the extent that they can enter cells and, and hijack cellular machinery to reproduce themselves. So I guess I don't think of them as life. Although, you know, you could argue that, you know, how about a fetus? I mean, a fetus also is, is incapable of independent life in those first, you know, few weeks. So um, are they live? I think you'd probably say that they are, but I guess I I, uh, I don't consider viruses live because they are dependent on cells to reproduce themselves. Um, you know, if I think about a uh, a tree and it, it, let's say a seed, you know, if you plant it, it would form into a particular kind of tree. If I observe the trees most of the time, I say, all right, they're definitely alive. But you know, what if the seed is it alive? Even on a microscopic level, it probably doesn't move or or do anything. But once it reaches the right soil and and moisture, then it, you know, it senses and, and is alive. So if you think about virions, they seem to be, I guess, like seeds. But then once the virus enters a cell, you know, a phage, whatever it is, uh, it, it, it acts, I guess, as if it's alive. So, it, you know, do you think, again, not alive or contingently alive? Or does that example help at all? Yeah, it does. I, I think it, it's I, I, obviously it's not a, a clearly answerable question. Um, it's more, I guess, your your the style of how you approach the question. I, I guess I see, I, I see bacteria as alive because they can reproduce themselves outside of cells. Um, um, you know, but when you, it's it's interesting just to make the analogy again to to the unborn child. I mean, is if you know, obviously the the pro life people consider life to have begun at conception. Um, the minute that that egg and sperm fuse, it's it's that's that's a life, even though that is obviously not a life independent of of a uterus and and the blood supply of the mother. So is that is that is that alive? And you know, again, it's sort of the pro life people, the uh, you know the um, the folks who uh, believe that it's a woman's right to choose. I mean, that's really in many ways the same argument. Is it is it if you're if you're not sentient, if you're not capable of independent life, are you alive? And some people would argue that children aren't alive till they're 30, you know, when they really are yeah. capable of life. But um, I guess, again, I, I, I guess I, well, I see viruses as um, because they are, are obligate intracellular parasites, um, they, and they there aren't, therefore aren't capable of independent life. So, the, so are they alive? Yeah, they're not capable of independent life, I guess. Is the, yeah. yeah. Well, there's debates all around. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, in terms of behavior, it, you know, to my knowledge, there's three kinds. You know, some like retroviruses can endogenize into a host genetic material. Um, and then there's some that are latent and will hang out for, you know, days, months, years in an organism, its whole lifetime. And then sometimes those latent ones become lytic and, you know, start attacking. And then there's just straight up lytic ones that seem to just enter, multiply and, and blow cells open. Why do you think that um, viruses exhibit these different behaviors and some of them appear to be contingent? Yeah, Um I don't know. I mean, they, they, there's just, they all have one thing in common, which is that they are trying to survive. It, it seems to me that the, um, the strategy that is the smartest is one that one doesn't kill the host. Um, two is easily transmitted. So, I mean, viruses, sometimes you'll see as they, as they gener as they mutate over time will become less virulent, meaning less likely to kill you because there's no advantage to the animal, to the, uh, to the virus to kill you because then ultimately it kills itself because it's dependent on you. But all these are strategies for, for the purpose of, of hanging around as long as they can. That's why I said. Well, if a virus is latent, um, how would it monitor the host's condition and then turn lytic at a certain point? You know, have you observed that either in the literature or in practice? Any viruses that again that are latent for a while, and then something happens, you know, to the host, and then now they're now they become lytic, they become a problem. Right. So varicella, a herpes simplex virus, sort of hang out um, lately, and then because of something, a stress, chemotherapy, sunlight, the virus reactivates, and then you know travels down a nerve root and causes disease. Um, it's fascinating. I mean, the, the fascinating part is is how the virus exists latently. You know, because it doesn't obviously express all its proteins, but it does express some proteins, just not enough to form a whole virus particle and be, you know, and be contagious. But it does hang out in the central nervous system. It is 
a fascinating phenomenon. Yeah, how do you imagine it's doing? It's monitoring monitoring the host condition. Do you think it's it's using cellular machinery to like send out extracellular vesicles for communication, or do you think it's able to uh, use the cell sensor, sensory apparatus to uh, monitor the host condition? Like, what's your what's your guess? Or, or maybe it's just just sort of immunological surveillance that the you know that the immune system at some level keeps that virus from you know uh, reproducing itself and then traveling down a nerve root. And when that immune surveillance is decreased, either because of uh, you know chemotherapy or another illness or age, then the virus uh, reawakens and travels down the nerve root. I mean, this was always the fear actually with the chickenpox vaccine is that you would increase the risk of shingles, increase the incidence of shingles, because by giving the chickenpox vaccine, you then were decreasing the amount of sort of natural boosting that was occurring with uh, chickenpox virus. That was always allowing people's immune systems who had already been infected with chickenpox to sort of be uh, be constantly boosted and then adequately surveil what the um, what was going on in the host. That didn't happen. I mean, when when the chickenpox vaccine came in, the CDC was worried about this, so they continued to monitor the instance of shingles, but it didn't it didn't increase. So eliminating the natural boosting that occurred with natural infection didn't increase the instance of shingles. That was the fear, though. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, that's a a different way of looking at it. So the virus may always trying to be lytic, but the immune system keeps it in check. And when it doesn't, then it's able to just continue on as it would. I guess right. that's the form of the answer. Yep. Okay, makes sense. Yeah. Um, why do you think there's a uh, a latency period between the the first you know the moment that someone's infected and when they they appear ill? Do you think it's just exponential multiplication of the virus inside cells, where you know like quote unquote enough cells are affected, or do you think there's other things going on, some monitoring that uh, determines okay, now is the time to to infect? You know, there's enough of the virus in the body. Yeah, I, I think the first, the, the, there's clearly an inoculum effect, meaning that the greater the exposure to your initial amount of virus, the more likely you are to develop symptoms, which says to me that, that now you are, have infected more cells initially, and those cells create, create viral particles, which then infect a, great, or infect a greater number of cells. So I think that's it. I think you, you know, for viruses like rotavirus or influenza virus, which have very short incubation periods, I mean, for flu, it can be as short as 18 hours. It's because the, the, the virus usually exposed to a fairly large quantity of virus. And then the virus is very well adapted to growing in the upper respiratory tract in the case of rotavirus and in the gastrointestinal tract. So the incubation periods are short. With other longer incubation period disease like measles, mumps, German measles, um, varicella, you know, it's it, it just takes, it's just a matter of getting enough virus, it, uh, enough cells infected to to be symptomatic and it just takes longer presumably because there's just uh it may be a lo- lower inoculum or it's just a, 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 the, the the virulence of the virus is just not as great as as for rotaviruses or flu and then there's the rabies which is you know certainly a killer um it, uh, people who aren't who develop symptoms with rabies who haven't been vaccinated are going to die um and they're the incubation periods as long as two months you know so for rotavirus can be a few days flu, 18 hours, you know, the other virus, measles, mumps, rubella, 10 to 14 days, and then rabies, two months, um, because it just takes a while to travel up the nerve root and then reproduce itself in neuronal cells and then cause disease. It just takes a while to do that, but it certainly makes it no less virulent in the end. So it's just the particular characteristics of the virus and its ability to interact and evade the host immune system, you think, that governs the latency period? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Makes sense. I don't know if there's a term for this, but you know, if I get infected by a virus and let's say I'm the first one, um, I label myself number one and then I, you know, hang out with you. I give it to you. You're number two and you hang out with someone and I give it to them, number three. And we get to like number 20. What would you expect in this passaging chain, you know, number 20 to, to look like uh, in terms of the virus? Do you think it will have uh, dramatically changed, become more virulent, less virulent, more commensal? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think from the purpose of the virus, from the standpoint of the virus, it doesn't want to get more virulent. It just wants to get, well, it wants to have, to have that bounce between virulence where it can at least be transmitted easily from one person to the next, sick enough so that they spread the virus, but not so sick that they, they that you kill the person. I mean, if you look at something like um, human immunodeficiency virus, I mean, there's a virus that that um, is perfect in many ways. It, it's, it arose in, in, in Cameroon in the 1930s from probably a hunter who, while killing a, a, uh, an ape or a, a monkey, um, 
you know, proceeded to infect himself with simian immunodeficiency virus, which then mutated enough in him to be able to cause him to at least transmit that virus to somebody else who then transmitted to somebody else. All the while, the virus, I think, was learning. It was learning how to, um, you know, to bind to CCR5 receptors, which made it easy then to transmit, to, to go from one cell to the next. I think it was learning how to suppress the immune system, meaning to reproduce itself in T helper cells. So it, 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 it was able to kill basically the orchestrator of the immune system, T helper cells. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. And it, it also learned to evade the immune system, not just by paralyzing the immune system, but by constantly changing its coat protein, the glycoprotein, so that it's as if you, so you would make antibodies, the person would make antibodies to that coat protein, which would neutralize the virus effectively, but the virus was constantly changing. It was like being infected with a hundred or a thousand different types of virus. I mean, that in many ways is the perfect virus. So do you think all viruses are headed towards a more commensal arrangement, or is it they're headed towards a balance between... Uh you know, whatever makes them proliferate the most, whatever that behavior may be. Right. I mean, it would certainly to their, to be to their advantage to do that. I mean, look at the sort of three viruses that emerged um, either in Southeast Asia or the Middle East with, you know, SARS-1, MERS, and now SARS-2, SARS-CoV-2. The first two viruses, in a sense, were too pathogenic. I mean, they, they virtually all the cases were moderate to severe cases. Therefore, it was easy to put a moat around those cases and to eventually eliminate, essentially, uh, SARS-1 and virtually eliminate MERS. Um, SARS-2, on the other hand, only 20% of those cases are moderate to severe disease, which is closer to 100% for SARS-1 and MERS. So now you have 80% of people who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, So, and, and they, they transmit the virus sufficiently. And that's what makes this now a worldwide pandemic, whereas SARS and MERS really weren't that. So as this continues, let's say with you know SARS-CoV-2, do you expect it to become less and less virulent over time? and reach some steady state amount of virulence? That might be, it certainly, it looks like it's become more contagious. The, the, I mean, it's a single strand in RNA virus, so it certainly mutates. The question is to what extent it functionally mutates. It does appear to have functionally mutated to the point that it's become somewhat more contagious. It hasn't become, a, to, to near as I can tell from what I've read, either more or less virulent, but it certainly would be to the advantage of the virus to become less virulent. You don't want to kill the host. That's what you need. You need the host cells to grow in, so why would you kill it? Okay, gotcha. Um, if someone is, uh, you know, incredibly sick, and I know this is a generalization, but if someone's like really sick with a virus and I, and I get it from them versus someone that, you know, barely has any symptoms or is asymptomatic and I get it from them, I know I'm unique and I have my own genetic makeup and uh, epigenetic marks, et cetera. But do you think there would be a correlation if I get a virus from someone that got incredibly sick versus someone that had the same virus that wasn't very sick? Do you think I'll be sicker or... It just, there's too many factors to analyze. I think you're likely to be sicker. I think people who are sicker are more likely to shed greater quantities of virus. And that does seem to be true in kids. That when kids get asymptomatic diseases compared to moderate to severe disease, those who have moderate to severe disease shed more virus. Um, in fact, they shed more virus even than adults who get moderate to severe disease do kids. Um, but the good news is children often don't get moderate to severe disease. So I think there is definitely an inoculum effect. And I think it does relate to the degree of symptomatology in the person who's shedding. So if, if I get sick from someone that's incredibly sick, you think it's more likely that I'll be very sick versus if I get a given virus from someone that's not very sick? I think so, yeah. You think that's just because of the viral load? I'll get more viral load from someone that's very sick? Or do you think there might be other factors? I think that's the biggest factor, inoculum effect. Okay, got it. Um, and I don't know if this is uh, across all viruses, but it seems at least for a few, there's a matching of the tropism of the virus. You know, it flu affects respiratory cells and then is passed on by coughing and sneezing. You know, rabies, I guess, seems to infect you know, salivary glands and then it's passed on by biting. Um, do you think that there is a matching between the cells that are affected in a given host and then the method by which that, that virus is transferred to a new person? And if so, why would that happen? Well, largely, but not completely. So, so flu is a respiratory pathogen. It's spread by small droplets. It reproduces itself in the upper respiratory tract. Um, virus in the bloodstream, viremia is not part of pathogenesis. The virus really doesn't effectively replicate it at other sites. So it really is spread by small droplet only. Rotavirus, on the other hand, is an intestinal pathogen. I mean, it reproduces itself in, in mature villus epithelial cells that line the small intestine. But pretty much everybody gets a rotavirus infection, meaning 
independent of the state of hygiene in the home or sanitation in the country, everybody gets infected with rotavirus by the age of five. If that's true, it can't just be by the enteric route. It can't just by, be by the intestinal route. I mean, if you look at, at, at viruses that are spread um, primarily by the intestinal route, like hepatitis A virus or, um, or bacteria like salmonella or shigella, those are, are always regional diseases. There's always regional outbreaks. When everybody in the country or the world is infected, by definition, there has to be a respiratory component. So I think, think rotavirus is, spread, is, is shed in the upper respiratory tract, and it is spread from the upper respiratory tract, even though that's not really its, its, its major site of replication. Yeah, it just, so, okay, so maybe mass, it just, it's just strange, like, you know, why is flu not spread sexually? Uh, maybe we can't even ascertain that, or, you know, why is uh, HPV not spread by coughing? But I guess maybe there's just not enough way to, to see it clearly enough to, to ascertain that, but at least there's like a predominant method by which these viruses seem to spread, and that seems to be matched, at least in some cases, to, you know, the cells affected. Yeah. So I just wonder if there's any reason. I think that's right. I think that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's a, I mean, viruses have tropism for various different types of cells based on those cell binding proteins. So I think that's right. Hmm. Okay. I've seen examples of uh, viruses, you know, being used literally as tools, you know, bacteria taking uh, pieces of viral, you know, DNA or RNA and incorporating it, you know, for bacterial immunity. I've even seen one example where I guess bacteria had used viral, uh, genetic material to make a spike protein themselves in their membrane and poke holes in other bacteria. So, you know, viruses seem to be tools themselves. They seem to be able to use cellular machinery for their own purposes. Um, I don't know, what, what governs, you think, uh, if the virus is going to be directing things or if a bacteria is going to be directing things or a somatic cell? It seems like, again, they are tools, but they're used as tools and they use tools themselves. It's kind of a strange, a strange dynamic. Yeah, actually, I think probably the people who under who came to learn about how cells worked the most were virologists, because using viruses, they could really see the degree to which viruses use cellular machinery and therefore study that cellular machinery. The great molecular biologists, cellular biologists were virologists at some level. So I think the viruses teaches, certainly teaches a lot about cells and how they work. Is there a particular uh, entry mechanism of a given virus that really fascinates you that you think is just amazing or crazy? Any examples? Um, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm amazed by the fusion mechanism. I mean, measles or respiratory synthesis virus, they fuse to cells and those viruses fuse to cells. And, and, and so when you try and make a vaccine against them, you have to be really careful. You, you can't, you can't use the protein on the surface of the cell so that it has the configuration after it's already fused, so-called post-fusion configuration. This is relevant to SARS-CoV-2 because SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is also a fusion protein. So this comes up in the now a lot with um, you know with people that are trying to make vaccines. You have to make sure you you maintain the configuration of that pre-fusion state. It is interesting to me though that that I can see how cells viruses bind to cells then are taken up by endocytosis, which many different types of particles are, because of the cells always sampling its environment. But the, the virus that fuses the cells just, you know, sort of permanently kisses the cell and then enters. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing how that happens. Hmm. Um, oh, oh, okay. That's what I want to ask you. You know, I, I probably know the answer to this, but <laughs> there is no answer. I've seen, you know, uh, some bacteria phage. They look like a moon lander. You know, they have like a head and a, a long shaft and a collar and tail fibers and then you know, SARS-CoV-2 supposedly looks like a, you know, just a, a sphere with, with spike proteins sticking out of it. But why do you think viruses have so many different shapes and entry mechanisms? You know, like how could they have, uh, how could all this have developed? I don't know. You'll have to ask the person who makes them who I assume is the devil. But um, <laughs> <laughs> are you amazed by their structure and entry you know, mechanisms and morphology and stuff? Especially bacteria phages, they do. They do look like something with the moon landing. They have like these little sort of stalks, you know, and then there's a head. Um, mm -hmm. Coronavirus looks a little more like, it looks like a crown, hence the name. And, and uh, that looks yeah. a little more like what I'm used to seeing in viruses, but it looks, you know, it's not all that different from rotavirus, but the, which was the virus I worked on. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, you know, bacteria phages are really weird looking. I agree. They're otherworldly. Yeah. If I had a cell and I sucked out, most of the, you know, some of the necessary machinery for the cell to run and the membrane was intact and a virus came and, you know, was going to fuse and enter. Do you think it still would? Or do you think it would sense that something's wrong and the, uh, 
the entry would be aborted at some point? That's a good question. I mean, if you took, I mean, the HPV for V vaccine, well, no, it's just a virus-like particle. Um, if you, so, so the, if you look at HPV vaccine under the electron microscope, it looks just like HPV. It, in other words, it's, 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 it's basically the, the way the vaccine is made, it looks like a virus-like particle. It's indistinguishable. Uh, by electron microscopy from H HP, from natural wild type HPV, obviously with the exception of the fact that the HPV vaccine doesn't contain the viral genome, does it does it still bind to cells in the same manner? I think the answer is yes. Well, would it still fuse well, HPV L1 protein? The surface protein is not a fusion protein, but if if uh, if you did that for SARS CoV2 or you did it for measles or RSV, um, and you could create it in a structure that looked just like it would still would it still fuse to the cell? I I, I think the answer would probably be yes. But I'm guessing. Yeah. No, because I wonder if you can make decoys if we were able to make what looked like a cell on the outside with the membrane and the right proteins and everything, the right receptors, but nothing was inside it. And you can inject that and, you know, viruses would fuse to it, inject their material and no one's home. Now they're stuck. You know, maybe that would be a, a, an interesting thing to create. The decoy cell. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Um, when, when you... Uh, I'm sure you know a bit about extracellular vesicles and you know bacterial plasmids and stuff, and they they seem to be virus-like. You know, they 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 have a membrane around them. They can enter other cells and you know regulate gene expression, et cetera. Um, do you think that they're they're virus-like? Do you think that they came from viruses or that uh, I mean, cells were able to produce viruses on their own? Like this goes back to you know which came first in evolutionary history, viruses or cells, and do you think that, uh, like, where do you think viruses came from? And do any of these other cell tools resemble viral-like activity enough that you could say, hmm, it's uh, strangely similar? Yeah, no, I hadn't. I assumed all viruses came from Camden, but no, I'm just kidding. Um, I think that, that um, this is a really good point. I mean, but, so bacterial plasmids, I mean, they, they arguably um, aren't alive either. I mean, they only are of value when they enter the cell or can do what they need to do in the inner cell. But I mean, that's how bacteria basically teach other bacteria to be resistant to various antibiotics is via by trans, transferring those plasmids um, because they want to help each other, you know, sort of survive the onslaught of antibiotics. So that's, that is interesting. I never thought that that is virus-like, but you're right. It in many ways is virus-like. And maybe its origins are that of, that of viruses. I wonder if even conception is virus-like, you know, the, uh, the sperm entering the egg. I don't know. It would just be funny if it, uh, if it was really studied in detail and it was extremely virus-like. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer these questions. I'm more of a vaccine person, but I'm not that's a okay. yeah. ecologist as much. No problem. You know, again, to my knowledge, I think of like one virus infecting one cell. But do you know any examples of multiple viruses attempting to infect a cell at the same time and coordinating their action? You know, two, three, four, a hundred viruses binding or fusing and uh, again, coordinating cell entry at the same time? I don't know. I mean, certainly these, these fusion viruses like respiratory syncytial virus form syncytia, meaning the virus causes cells to clump together as it, fu it essentially fuses all their, their cell membranes together. So I'm not sure if that's, that's it must be at some level to the advantage of the virus that maybe it can inject its genome. Um, but I think it only has, it can only inject its genome into a single cell, right? I mean, it's not, um, I don't know, whether by bringing those virus, those cells all close together, it makes it much easier then for viruses to travel from one cell to the next after a cell reproduces the virus. Yeah, or if, if two viruses, you know, land and attach and fuse you know, in a cell, but they're very, very close to one another, you know, perhaps through the cell membrane, they can signal each other and again, coordinate cell entry. I have no clue. I'm just asking if you think it may be possible. Yeah, I think that's possible. It's an interesting thought. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then um, you're probably familiar with, I guess, what people call quasi-species. So I guess it's like slight variants of a given virus. Um, you know, if I think of like a bee colony, you know, you have bees, some are worker bees, some are the queen, et cetera. They're, so they're, they're phenotypically different, but they're all bees. Do you think that viruses um, and their quasi-species, you know, when, when they infect, are people getting just one particular strain of virus? Or are they getting like a whole close variation of strains? And if so, do, do those quasi-species somehow, again, coordinate infection? Uh, are they necessary for a proper infection? Yeah, it makes, I mean, certainly single-stranded RNA viruses mutate uh, 
with every cycle of replication. I mean, it's a single strand of RNA, therefore its replication isn't highly faithful. So you would think that it, it's not going to be faithful in a certain way that would be advantageous for the virus. Um, in the case of something like um, HIV, it's that the virus continues to mutate its surface protein basically to evade the immune system. I think with other viruses, it may be more subtle or something other than that. And maybe there is a coordination to try and again, all for the purpose of um, making a lot of viruses that can then be transmitted to someone else who can transmit it to someone else so that they continue to live. If a cell is infected with a given virus, does that virus tend to ward off other viruses You know, and prevent super infection, you know, like a dog guarding a bone? Well, well, yeah. I mean, the, the, I'm not sure the, the, the cell does it, but the, I mean, typically when you're, um, when you are infected, your body will, in response to that infection, make interferon, which is an, inter, as its name suggests, an interfering particle. So it interferes with the capacity of other viruses to infect at the same time. So it's your, the host immune system really that, that will then respond and make it less, it's, and have a general non-specific response that has a general antiviral uh, effect that will then make it less difficult or more difficult for a second virus to infect. The virus doesn't do that. It's the host immune system that does that. Oh, okay. Hmm. Interesting. Um, in terms of uh, bacteria and their, you know, the phages that prey upon them, I guess I'll call it the phageome. Do you think that the, the phageome is like an integral part of, uh, of a bacteria's immunity? Or do you think the bacteria's immunity really comes from just the bacteria? The reason I ask is that, you know, again, it's been observed that bacteria will take viral genetic material, incorporate it, and then change itself, you know, become more immune, uh, protect itself against phages. So. Well, I mean, at some level, that's what diphtheria does. I mean, diph diphtheria produces a toxin. That toxin is is produced by essentially what was a bacteriophage. I mean, the Carinibacteria, Carinibacteria diphtheriae was infected with a phage sometime long ago, which then made a toxin, which actually makes it easier for the for the bacteria then to bind to cells, reproduce itself, the bacteria in the upper respiratory tract because of that toxin production. So there's an example of viruses and bacteria working together for the purpose of overwhelming the host. Okay, and um, I guess last question: what What role do you think that uh, viruses have played in evolution and adaptation and speciation? Yeah, I mean they they I think they've certainly changed the course of human history. I mean, smallpox probably killed about five hundred million people. Um, you know, the the pan, flu pandemic of nineteen seventeen eighteen killed about a hundred million people. Change the course of human history, that's for sure. And, you know, these endogenous retroviruses that are there in all of us, or bacteriophages, which are there at the, you know, the, the level of, you know, 10 to the 30th. I, I think that they, they certainly, um, people have shown, you know, the type of bacteria that line your, the surface of your, your body. I mean, you have 10 times more bacteria on the surface of your body than you have cells in your body. Um, determine whether you're likely to get diabetes or obesity or asthma or, or, or various allergies. So I think, and those, the viruses that are so much of an integral part of those bacteria, no doubt are part of that. Okay. Well, very good. Well, Paul, I know it's, some of the questions have been a little bit outside your area, but you still answered them. So I appreciate it. And, um, <laughs> I take yeah. that from Donald Trump, you know, he answers everything, even though he doesn't know anything. So, you know, exactly. just kidding. It's a joke. Maybe he's the great speculator. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> so what, what's the best way for people to find out more about you and your work? Um, I, there's a website called paul-offit.com that my wife said. Okay. She's very proud of it. Oh, excellent. 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 All right. So paul-offit.com. And uh, great. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate Thanks, it. Richard. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.